We certainly appreciate the good number that's here. Uh, I ask certain for your prayers if you know the Lord. Um, I uh, let the devil hinder me more than I should about what I need to try to bring, what the Lord might lay on me. And uh, it's, uh, it's easy when it's all uh, encouraging and it's all... I say it works sometimes. It's all rainbows and butterflies. Everybody wants to be around now. Everybody wants to see the, the goodness, but nobody wants to do sometimes the things that has to be done to lead up to that time. And as a pastor, there is encouragement that's needed, and I try my best by the help of the Lord to do that. Preach to the lost as it's needed. And I try by the help of the Lord to do that, to teach. And... Uh, there's times you have to warn people. Um, and this Bible talks about that. The yeah. book of Ezekiel talks about a watchman and that he must, when he hears the trumpet, that he needs to sound the warning. Um, now, warnings are not pleasant. Warnings make us uncomfortable. But I'm thankful today that there's still warnings going out. Yeah. When you quit hearing the warning, watch out. Right. When it goes silent, Watch out. It's too late. So we want to ask you to pray for us as we have some thoughts on our, on our heart. And I, I sometimes say I trust it's of the Lord. I know it's <laughs> of the Lord. In the book of Genesis in the 41st chapter, we're going to take a reading lesson. Old Joseph had been put through the ringer, you might say, up and down in his life, but he never took his eyes off the Lord. And we find here in chapter 41 in the first chapter, in the first verse here of this 41st chapter, it says, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. Behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up at, uh, after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean flesh and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean flesh kind did eat up the seven well-favored and the fat kind, so Pharaoh awoke. And he slept and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears uh, and blasted the east wind and sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof, and Pharaoh told them his dream. But there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. We're going to stop right there for a moment of time. Uh, we'll read more, or at least reference more of this chapter. We find here that the Lord began to deal with Pharaoh in his dream. Now, Pharaoh was uh, a king. He had a great, uh, vast kingdom to rule over. had uh, power. He had power. He told somebody to go get him something. They went and got it. Or they suffered the consequences. Right. He wanted something built to him. It was built. To bring him pleasure. Whatever it might be. We've got leaders in our country today. That I wish the Lord would trouble them in their dreams. Yeah. And I believe that he can. I believe he can trouble them in their dreams. Yeah. Now we, we talk about fussing about our leaders. But maybe we need to pray the, the Lord on them. Uh, this is to our benefit if the Lord gets a hold of us. And here we find this man that I'm sure that others, they would have never dreamed to have brought before this king this scenario uh, to have troubled him. They'd have been afraid to, but the Lord ain't afraid of nobody. He, he, he ain't afraid of any of you. He ain't afraid of any king. He ain't afraid of any nation in this world. I'm going to tell you what, he ain't afraid of nobody. If he wants to trouble somebody, you watch out. He'll do it. Mm -hmm. And here he made him to dream of these two dreams. One of the 
well-favored and fat uh, cows that come up out of the uh, the river, and there were seven of them, and they were they were full and they were strong, and then seven that were just ill-favored bones, and uh, they come up out, and they stood by them, and they somehow in this dream they devoured those that were well-favored. And he woke up, scared him to death. He woke straight up. Y'all ever had a dream that scared you so much you just woke up? He knew it was a dream. He went back to sleep. He dreamed again about a corn uh, stalk that come up with seven full ears that looked good and, and were prosperous. And then there was an east wind and seven uh, that were not full, that were rank, that were not well. They come up and they devoured it. And he woke up again and it was a dream. And it says that he began to get troubled about this. I wish that our leaders were troubled. Yeah. Troubled. Uh, I, I, I pray that the Lord will trouble them. If this week doesn't trouble all of our country, we've got problems. We ought to be troubled about the direction that we're headed. We ought to be troubled about the division that is in our country. We ought to be troubled that our countrymen have ideas that go against the Word of God. We ought to be troubled. And our leaders ought to be too. I'm satisfied that Pharaoh was completely satisfied with the direction of his life. Now this was not a saved man. This was not one that worshipped God. But I'm going to tell you what, God got a hold of him just as well as somebody that called on him. And I hope and pray that the Lord will do that to the, our leaders. He asked for people, all his magicians and all his wise men. He told them the dream and they couldn't interpret it. I'm going to tell you what, there's things that go on that this world, they're going to try to figure it out and they can't because it'll be spiritually discerned. And you're going to have to have the Lord Almighty to be able to discern the Word of God and the things that go on in this world. He had a butler there that had been in uh, prison with Joseph. And he told him, he said, now there was this man, this Hebrew, that when I was in prison with him, he said, now he can interpret a dream because there is a dream had. He told us what it'd be. He said, I'd be restored. And then the other would be hanged. He said, and that's what happened. So he called Joseph to him. And he said, tell me. Tell me the interpretation of this dream. He said, it said, they say you can do it. Joseph, knowing his role, knowing uh, who it really come from, he said, it's not me that does the interpreting. It's not me to tell you of myself. He said, God shall give Pharaoh. God will be the one to show you. I'm going to tell you what, people will go to a preacher as quick as anything and ask them for answers. I'm going to tell you where you can get your answers. You can get them from God. Kevin don't got the answers. I can tell you what the Word of God says, but you need to go to the Lord to get your answers. I understand why they come to a preacher. I understand why they ask a pastor. I do. I've asked pastors in the past. And I'm going to tell you what, I'm sure I'll ask my fellow preachers in the future. But when it really gets down to it, it's the Lord that gives the answer. He'll be the one that gives the answers today. He went on and he said, tell him a dream. And he began to tell him. He recited it all again, just as he had. Something that sticks out, he said, not only do these sick cows devour the well cows, he said after they had, they were looked just as poor as they did before the animal. That it was, you would think, somebody eats, well, it's going to make them fat. Somebody eats well and nourishes their flesh, it's going to make them stronger. Well, these cows and these ears of corn, after devouring the other, they were just as poor as they were before they ever started. Now that would trouble me too, wouldn't it? You, it'd be puzzling. Job has told him, he said, well, I know the dream you've had he says uh and y'all bear with us here and brown we're going to jump down around verse 25 it says and joseph said unto pharaoh the dream the fa uh the dream of pharaoh is one and god has shewed pharaoh what he's about to do the seven good kind are seven years and the seven good ears are seven years and the dream is one 
And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted the east wind shall be as seven years of famine. And this is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, what God is about to do, he has shewed unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all of the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And then the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of the famine following. For it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it, was, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now we find here that here Joseph, by the Spirit of God, was able to interpret this dream that these seven good cows and seven good ears of corn were seven years of plenty. Seven years where the land brought forth and they were able to reap and have all that they wanted and then some. But after those seven years were going to end, there were going to be seven years of famine. Seven years of nothing. It wasn't going to cover just part of the land. It says it's going to cover all the land. And he went on to tell him, he said, they will, it'll be so bad, it uses the word grievous, the seven years of famine, it's going to be so bad that everybody will forget the seven years of plenty. Now that's pretty bad. That you won't even recall to your memory how good that you had had it because you have so little. He began to tell him, he said, this is going to come to pass shortly. And he advised Pharaoh to set up wise men among him, to set up and to take during these seven years of plenty and to start laying up, start taking. And yes, you ate for the moment, but you rationed and you saved up for the years that would famine that would come so that they would be able to withstand those seven years. He wondered, why. Well, where can we find such a man? Well, he, he found Joseph. He said, I'm going to make him. He's going to nobody and going to be higher than him except I am. And he put him over everything and he began to work and have a group and a team or an army, so to speak, of people to work, to gather and to lay up for this time that was certainly coming. And though that he had interpreted this dream, though that he knew it was coming, though Joseph was no doubt a man that God's hand was with. Yeah, yeah. The Lord was with Joseph everywhere he went. You'd think Joseph was counted out. You'd say, well, that's the end of him. That's what we'd say. That's the end of him. He'd be accused of something he didn't do. Why, I knew something wasn't right about him, what people probably thought. But the Lord was with him. He got cast over in that dungeon, in that prison. Well, that'd be the end of him, but the Lord had favor with him there, even among them. And God brought him back up, and here he was. But what my point in saying that was, him being a good man, him doing what the Lord wanted him to do, did not keep this famine from coming. It did not keep the Lord from doing what he was about to do, which was cause them to go through a very hard time. And I'm going to tell you what, I believe hard times are coming. Y'all bear with me as we look over. We'll come back over there, if the Lord willing, into that chapter. But we want to look in the book of Jeremiah, the 14th chapter. It says, And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth. Now, if you look this word dearth up, it means scarcity, want, or famine. So basically the same thought of famine can be applied right here to this. Concerning the famine or the dearth, Judah mourneth and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground and the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. Their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters and they came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty, 
they were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. Because the ground is chapped, for there was no rain in the earth, and the plowmen were ashamed and covered their heads. Yea, the hind also calved in the field and forsook it, because there was no grass. And the wild asses did it stand in the high places. They snuffed up the wind like dragons. Their eyes did fail because there was no grass. We look here and we find a picture also being told of a famine, of a, a time where there was no rain and there was no food. How that these nobles would send their little ones out to draw water and they went to draw water and they couldn't find none. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I've never lived in a time like that. I've never lived in a time of want. I was born in 1971. Now, we didn't have, I know what it's like to wear hand-me-downs. I know what it's like to, and these kids probably don't. I know what it's like, and I, I, I'm thankful for my upbringing. There's people here who had it rougher than I ever had. But I can remember having them jeans that rose up way on up above your ankles and the pants is all blue where they washed them so much and mama had to put patches on her knees where we wore them out and the patches would be really really blue and it didn't match nothing i know what it's like to eat beans and taters and that's all we had for supper i know what those things are like and how that we uh didn't have no heat and air in the house we had air when the windows went up and we had eat when the stove was above I want you to understand that was some of the best days of my life and I didn't know it. But I've never known what it was like to not have water, tea, or whatever it was I wanted to drink. I've never known what it was like to sit at a table and not have any to, anything to eat or more than enough to eat. I don't know what that's like. But there's people here that probably could tell the times that were harder in their lives and they could recall back to what their families, their grandparents probably told them, a really hard time. I can remember hearing people tell about my father when my grandfather was disabled when my daddy was just a boy, that my uncle had to buy my daddy's shoes because they couldn't afford none themselves. Now, daddy's just 74 years old, so that ain't that many years ago in the scheme of things. But God provided for them. They had what they needed. But here we find, imagine asking your little ones to go fetch some water and they go and there was nothing there. They went and they hunted every little place they could to find water. You can go a while without eating, but you can't go very long without water. You let your body go without water very long and it'll start shutting down. Your organs will start shutting down. It's just how that it is. And they began to go. They couldn't find anything. And they come back uh, with their vessels empty. And it says they were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. They felt the shame. They knew why they was in the shape they was in. And we look and we find that it says the ground was chapped. There was no rain on the earth. You know, there's places in this world today, son, it's chapped. It is chapped. The ground don't bring forth nothing. It's just desert. It's just cracked. Y'all ever seen pictures of ground in foreign countries where the ground is just cracked? It's so dry. I'm going to tell you what. That can be Macon County in a heartbeat. That can be our country in a heartbeat. And it talks about the hind or the cow, the cow how the she calf bring forth a, 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 a calf and just leave it. Not lick it over, not see to it, nothing, just leave it. Ain't no need to have it. There's not enough grass for me. It won't be enough grass for it. The, the will to live began to wane even from the creation. It began to wane. It began uh, to find that it even talks about how the uh, donkeys, so to speak, how that they would just uh, be to the ground and the dust would be, and when they take in breath and blow it out, it'd just be dust going everywhere. Says they look like dragons because we know what a dragon's supposed to breathe out. And then it says here, they said, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou for thy name's sake, for our backsides are backslides are many, and we have sinned against thee. They knew why they's in the shape they's in. 
There wasn't no wondering why this happened. I'm going to tell you, troublesome times are on the way, and there's going to be a lot of people that are going to say, why has God forsaken us? Why has God turned against America? Why has God turned against this land? Why has he turned against Maiden County? Why has he turned against us? There are going to be many surprised. But y'all ain't going to be surprised. God's people has been listening, and in this book a little bit ain't going to be surprised. It'll be by our sins that this comes. It'll be by our backslidings that this comes. And here, they playing on the Lord's mercy. They began to ask Him, Lord, have mercy. In verse 10, it says, Thus saith the Lord. This people, they have loved to wander. They have refrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They were begging for mercy. He said, the time for mercy's up right now. My mercy's run out. Now you're going to have to answer. He went on and he said here, Thus saith the Lord, my, they, have, they have loved to wander. Wander. Just go wherever they want to go, do whatever they want to do. I say all the time, we're just like little toddlers. Once they get able to walk, that attitude of that child changes. You mamas and daddies, these little ones, you know it starts to change. They're dependent on you. And then they start getting that desire to be independent. And as a little girl told me one time out of Hazel about her mom and daddy, she said, if they just let me do what I want to do, everything would be all right. What? She said, I know what the problem is. She said, mom and daddy won't let me do what I won't do. I'm going to tell you what, that's how we are with the Lord. We do what we want to do. And we justify whatever we want to in our own minds. Kevin does it, you do it, we all do it. We love to wander. We love to roam without borders. Why, you know, I don't see anything any happier than a cow that's got out of the field, out of the fence, and over into somebody's yard. Well, they're happy as they can be because they're somewhere that they've always wanted to go. They don't want them restrictions. Just go and roam wherever they want to. That's how we are, right? Go anywhere, do anything without any repercussion. The Lord says you've loved to wander. You've refrained. You've not refrained your feet. And now I don't accept it. I don't accept this plea. I don't accept it now that the trouble has come. You're going to have to suffer for what you have done. He goes on and says in that chapter that the uh, the prophets have prophesied lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto, uh, spake unto them, and they prophesied unto you false vision of divination and a thing of naught and deceit of their heart. Now, it would nothing do me better to come in and to preach on things that would really make you feel better about yourself and send you on home. But sometimes we have got to, and regardless of our personal feelings or how we might be perceived, Tell you what the Lord says. If I'm going to preach Kevin, then I need to stay at home. There are preachers today in our ranks that are preaching themselves and not preaching God. We have had preachers for too long preach their will. And their will has got us in a mess. It has allowed us to wander. It has allowed us astray. Success and prosperity has crept in to our pulpits and they have prophesied lies so you'll pay them. I want you to understand they have hurt you. They have hurt the cause. We have failed our God by not prophesying thus saith the word of God. And the word of God is this. There's famine coming. Say, so, well, does that mean the interest rates are going to go up? What we're going to have to face, the interest rates really ain't going to be a, a matter to us. What we're going to have to face, how much they pay on the savings account, which is near nothing, ain't going to matter to us. Tax breaks won't matter to us one of these days. Who is in president, whether they're a Democrat or Republican or whatever they want to call themselves, Ain't going to really matter one of these days when the famine comes. 
And it will come because we have turned ourselves away from God. Lord says it's coming. It's coming to pass. And there ain't a thing we can do to stop it. It's a coming. You look throughout history, there's never been a nation rise high that did not fall. Never been one. Of all their power and all their might, that didn't come crashing down. That didn't become the weakened. Does that happen overnight? Not always. But Lord can bring one to its knees in a heartbeat. I've said for a long time, this right here, electricity. You let this depart from us right now and we are done. Everything is tied into it. You can't even get gas without some electricity. You can't do anything anymore without it. If the Lord turns the lights off, I'm going to tell you what, we're going to go hungry. There's going to be a famine. He can dry up all these oil wells. He can dry them up. He can keep it so that we can't get another ounce of gasoline. And He can bring us to our very knees. It's a hug. It's a coming. And it's coming because that we have turned ourselves away from God. So, well, but we ain't in California. No, we ain't. But I'm going to tell you what. Macon County has turned herself away from God. The church has turned herself away from God. And I look and I think back to this lesson of how the seven years of plenty. Something was said in Sunday school and I've pondered all week. Where are we at right now? Where do we stand? Are we and still in the seven years of plenty? Or is the famine already upon us? Is it near even at the gate? Is the trouble that lies wide at a hand? Have we waited too late to lay up? Have we waited too late? Is it too late to lay up? Did we wait to the seventh hour? Have we waited too too long? Oh Lord, I pray that we've not waited too long. I pray that it's not too late for us to lay up, to sustain ourselves for when the trouble sometimes are coming. Because when they come, it'll be too long. It may be too late to set out tomato plants and green beans. It'll be too long, too late to sit out some things and to go to the store and try to lay up. I ain't telling you this, so we'll all ransack and get every stitch of toilet paper that's at Walmart. All right, they already done that in this country. You think this virus is trouble? There's bigger problems that are waiting. And what I have witnessed in this country lets me know we are not ready for the next troubles that are coming. We have panicked. We have feared. That we cannot see. But how many of us have turned toward God over this? How many of us have asked God? And I'm telling you what, even if we have, as far as we win, He may have said you're just going to have to live through it. Going to have to live through it. I look and I find back in this lesson here in this 41st chapter of Genesis. Did this famine come and Joseph had gathered and laid up? says that he left, uh, it says here in verse 45 or 49, it says Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering for his without number. Now he worked hard. Them people that worked for him, they worked hard. And they laid up. They worked and they kept their nose to the grindstone and they did not look back. Knowing, well, it'd be easy. You get in about that third or fourth year and go, we've got plenty. We got plenty. We can ease up. But they didn't. They just kept on working like they didn't have anything. They kept on working like nothing was ever going to be again. And then when it come, verse 53 says, And the seven years of plenteous was, uh, that was ended in the land uh, was in the land of Egypt were ended. Now seven, I believe it, they had seven literal years, but seven is a thought of completeness. When things were come to an end, then the seven years of dearth goes back there to Jeremiah. Seven years of dearth, their famine began to come, according to as Joseph has said, and it was a dearth or famine in all the lands. But in the land of Egypt, there was bread. There was trouble everywhere. Everywhere. 
There was a famine in Egypt. There was a famine in all lands. But because they had worked, because they had prepared, because they had laid up, they were able to eat bread during those seven years. And people come from all over. Joseph's daddy sent his brothers down there. The Lord was in all that to preserve their life. But he sent them down there. They got word that there's corn in Egypt. There is place down there to be able to go and to buy and to sustain our life. Go to where the food is. Go and get it and bring back the report. And not only did they go and they get bring back the report, they moved down there. They went to where the food was to sustain them. I believe that's probably what we would do, wouldn't we? There was nothing around here. And we heard that somewhere in the middle of Kansas, you could go there and there was food there. I believe there'd be some say, we need to figure out a way to get there. We need to be able to figure out a way to get there so we'll live. Because if we sit here, we'll die. I look and I think it, obviously, and I believe it is going to be hard times, naturally speaking. I, I, I believe that, that we are uh, sold out to foreign countries in this country. Yeah. It's evident that we are. Yeah. If we got a debt our great-grandchildren will never pay. Uh, it, it just boggles my mind. If you and I live like our federal government spends money, we'd been broke a long time ago. They'd have had called in everything on us. Let me tell you something. If they start calling in what this country owes other countries, we are going to be speaking a foreign language one of these days. We'll be the servants of other nations before it's said and done. Without a shot ever being by. Without a shot being by. Little by little, they're taking over and they're influencing our way of life and we don't even realize it. And I'm not a big political guy. I don't read a bunch of stuff. And if I can see it, as ignorant as I am, I'm going to tell you what, it scared me to know what the Lord knows about what's going on. But I've got news for you. There's more serious things than not having money in your account. There's more serious things than not having lights. We can turn these lights off. We can sit here and wrap up in the cold and we can make it. We could go and get an old pot belly stove and sit back in here if we needed to. That could happen here. And it may happen again. But I'm going to tell you one thing we cannot do without is the Word of God. The Scriptures teach me over in the book of Deuteronomy in the 8th chapter, I believe it is, 8th chapter and verse 3. It says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not that he might make thee to know man, uh, make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. This Word of God here being evident to us, and, and I, I, I enjoy trying to study. I'm not good at studying. I, I'm not a very smart individual. But I'm thankful that the Lord gives me a Bible to have. I'm thankful I've got one. Don't you? There was a time that they would stand and listen to a man recite from memory the Word of God just to hear it read. They would stand, not sit in comfortable seats. They'd stand just to hear somebody read from the Word of God. People worried about them coming after our guns. I'd be more worried about them coming after this. Amen. That's what I'd be more worried about. Them. Come and confiscating the written Word of God from our homes. Wouldn't you be worried about that? Yeah. Our government's already done a good job of confiscating it out of the schoolhouses. Yeah. Yeah. It's out of there. Right, uh, right now. It's not, it's not there. It might find a few scattered about, especially in this county. But there's some there wouldn't be. Wouldn't be there. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be found there. 
But I'm going to tell you what, and I know I'm a pretty poor excuse of one, but it's a whole different ball game for somebody to read it than it is to preach from it. It's a whole different thing to read from it and to hear it read than to hear it preached from in the Spirit and power of God. In the book of Amos, in the 8th chapter, it says in verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor of a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Yeah. For they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to east, and they shall run from um, for, uh, to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. I'm going to tell you what, there's a famine of coming. Yeah. And we are already experiencing a famine of hearing the word of God. Yeah. So, but preacher, we can go anywhere. We can, just, we can drive just anywhere here and preach preach. I, I am the weakest that the Lord has ever called. And I, but I'm going to tell you what, I've heard some and they ain't doing much preaching. They're doing a lot of ear tickling. Tell you what you want to hear so you come back next Sunday. Tell you what you want to hear so they can get as many members as they want to at that church. they tell you what you want to hear. Pat you on the back. Stay way away from sin. But they ain't doing you a bit of good. Not doing you a bit of good. Not teaching the doctrines and principles of the Lord's church has failed us. That's right. And I find a generation of preachers that have been raised up not hearing anything, not being taught anything. And they are trying to preach in pastor churches knowing very little, and they are weakening the cause of God. Right. And there will be other men that will be called that sit under them, sit under the preaching and teaching, and yet they'll become weaker because they know even less. I'm going to tell you what, the famine is here of hearing the Word of God. Amen. And it is only going to get worse. Try to find pastors. Try to find, there's not enough pastors in the Lord's church right now. Right. Churches are having a hard time going years upon years trying to find a man. I'm going to tell you what, if fellowship was not an issue, there's not enough that are called that are able. Right. And we're hurting, ain't we? Yeah. Are we not suffering? Mm-hmm. Are churches not suffering? Mm-hmm. Are young preachers not suffering? Mm-hmm. Are these young ones not suffering from not being able to hear from the Word of God? I'm just going to tell you what I believe. And I I ain't going to hold back because the Lord, He'll whoop me if I do. I'm going to tell you what. What He gives, He can take just like that. He can shut her off like a faucet. I have never desired to move away from here. This is my home. This is where I love. But God could tell me in a moment's notice, you're leaving. And if I follow Him, I'd have to go. Wonder, wonder if he started calling out all these good pastors around. Not that I'm one of them. I'm like the low bottom. The totem pole's here and I'm right under it. If there's such a thing. But wonder if he began to call these sound Baptist preachers and send them off on the mission field far away from Macon County. What would have happened? With the churches around here today, they begin to weaken. They begin to shrivel up. They would begin to starve and not of water or of food of the natural sense, but of the spiritual sense. I'm going to tell you what, it'd be a bad day for Macon County. It's a bad day today. And you might think this don't fix you. I'm going to tell you what, it affects you and your children and your grandchildren. So my kids are little. You better have a long-term vision about what you're doing here at Friendship Church. You better have your glasses on, your spiritual eyesight in, in mind, and to be preached, okay, calling on God for future preachers to be raised up. That'll hold on and preach and study and learn this word. And be able to help your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. Some of which will never see your great-grandchildren. To be able to them to carry on. Say, what has that got to do? I'm going to tell you what we need to be laying up right now. Yeah. Yeah. We need to be laying up right now. Right. Y'all will never see it. You're seeing the beginnings of it. Yeah. But y'all won't ever see it, some of y'all ones. 
But there's going to come a day the whole Friendship Church is going to have a hard time finding yeah. pastor right. if yeah. it don't start laying up towards God right now. If y'all don't get your nose down and work and labor and lay up just as much as can be laid up for the future generations, they're going to starve to death. They're going to starve to death. You might say, but we had a good meeting. Look at this crowd. Look at it. We just had baptizing the four. I'm going to tell you what. We need to keep our nose to the grindstone. We don't need to ease up. We need to keep our foot on the pedal and keep working and laboring for God. We need to work and labor and lay up at Friendship Church towards God that when the famine comes, you can still eat here. That there will still be a preacher somewhere called even from afar that would make the distance to travel here to preach the Word of God. Y'all might be the only place around that have anything for anybody to eat. This bill might not be big enough to contain them. That they'd find one that would come from afar because the Lord had sent them this way to be able to preach all the whole counsel of God that the Word would be here that you could eat and be fed. Eat and be fed of spiritual food that'll last much longer than the natural food. Y'all better be laying up. Now's the time to be digging in. We used to, I, I've never farmed like a lot of y'all farm by no means. But we used to have corn and beans and taters. Uh, we, had a, we had potatoes. It looked like a football field when I was a kid long. And uh, they'd go to plow and those potatoes would start rolling out. It was the fruit of labor. And they would... Uh, he would take a down the middle, and then we'd come back on the upper side, and then we'd turn and we'd go back down the lower side, turning up everything that we could get. Yeah. Now I've used this towards the lost. Ain't today you'd reach down in there and there'd be some rotten, and you just sling it off. <clears throat> pa always wanted the big bacon potatoes. So boys have them are the good ones. We'd get them, and wow, that, that, that's good. And I'd say, Pa, what about these little ones? He said, ah, oh, they ain't good for nothing. And old Granny, though, she said, ah, oh, I can do something with them. Put them in there. We can eat them. She'd put them in with green beans and little ones and cook them in there with them potatoes. That was good. She didn't have to worry about cutting up the big potatoes for that. We would pile all them up in the buckets, and we'd take them to the barn, and they would put them all a whole dug and we pour them in there and put, I don't know what we what they put over them, something to protect them and put hay over them to keep them. And there was just a few of us out there working, but my cousins sure did know and their moms and daddies knew where the potatoes were. They wasn't there for the work, but they knew where the potatoes was. They sure loved to come and get them. I'm going to tell you what, we laid up one time a year to eat all year on those potatoes. We laid up every year Year after year, I thought, would there ever be a time when I was a kid? But you know what? It began to get in that land, in that little spot we had. The strength of it began to dry up. And it didn't produce the same. It didn't produce the same. So us and our wisdom, we just kept laying out more ropes. Just, just kept going as far as we could. We finally gave up on that little spot and we moved it to another location where the ground had never been used. And they all come back. Yeah. That strength, that cleanliness, I'm going to tell you what, if we don't get our land here, our spiritual land in the condition it needs to be in, fertile, fertile that it'll produce, God will just pick it up. Yeah. He'll say, let me find some land over here that is going to be more fertile. Yeah. And produce more. That's what happened when he moved to the Gentiles, and that's what he'll do again. Right. You might say, Brother Harrison, why would anybody come back next Sunday? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know why they won't come hear me anyway. But I'm going to tell you what, if we don't, if we don't, these little boys and girls, these young couples, children, they're going to starve. 
Y'all do a great job singing, and y'all know how much I enjoy it. Coming down through here from the restroom after y'all got started, it's like it's in stereo coming down that aisle. But you can't sing the gospel. You can't do it. Can't do it. It'll touch that heart. But that gospel is what'll prick that heart. That's what'll prick that heart. And I'm going to tell you what, we need to pray to God right now. Y'all need to be a working and laboring and inviting people to come so the storehouses are full for Friendship Church. For future generations to come. Because I'm afraid what we've done is we've let those men get down too low. We've let them get down. We've eat so good that we think, well, we're doing plenty good. And much like our country, we're spending more than we're taking in. We're spending more than we're laying up. And we're going to have to get to work. I feel for the young preachers. I've had it relatively. I have had it easy and very blessed. I can't argue with the Lord for how good He's been to me. But I worry for them. I worry for them. But yeah, I've heard people say, I wish we had preachers like we used to. I wish we had congregations like we used to, too. I wish we had people just starving, chomping at the bit to get to church. I mean, prayed up. They didn't have much, but boy, son, they was laying up towards God. You know, you don't have to trust in riches to stray from God. You don't. A poor man can stray from God. Yeah. It's just, you know, money is irrelevant, really. It's just the condition of that heart. But I've done what the Lord wants me to do, whether y'all like it or not. But I hope that it finds your heart. Yeah. Yeah. This country has been through a lot in a short amount of time. I don't know anybody that's lost their business, but there are obviously those across our country. They're losing everything that they own. <clears throat> losing everything. If they lose everything they own, they don't have the Lord, what do they got? Nothing. Some of y'all lose everything you got, you still got the Lord. I don't want to lose everything I got no more than y'all, do y'all? But I'm going to tell you what we're going to dig in. We're going to have to pray. We're going to have to testify. And we're going to have to ask the Lord for something to do from Sunday to Sunday out at our jobs, out in the community, that this light right here will shine, that the Lord will not just bless now, but it'll be so much blessings that they start counting back, start lighting up. Uh, because that famine is coming. There ain't a thing I can do or you can do to stop it. It's coming. Would y'all move to where the truth was? If you heard that it was in the middle of the country, as the only place there was, an old preacher, would y'all go? The truth of the matter is, is we wouldn't. We're going to live where we live. So how do you know that? Oh, I'd go. I remember a preacher saying that one time, and I thought, oh, I would. I was sitting there, I thought, oh, I'd go. There's a church in Louisiana that's been sitting down there without a pastor for 15 years. 15 years without a preacher. No preachers in that area. Without a preacher, 15 years. Why ain't they moved to Tennessee? Because that's where they're from. Learned this on Andy Griffith. The ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's better for us to be on the front end than on the back end. This is our effort. I'll hush. I can go on and on, but I'll, I'll hush. I don't even know if there's a song you sing after something like this. But, uh, but if there's a song y'all want to sing, sing a song, do whatever you feel the Lord wants you to do. Thank you for listening. Pray for me.